There was a column a couple weeks ago about, um, I don't think it cited BuzzFeed particularly, but there was a, David Carr had a column in the New York Times about kind of the, that, the that dangers of... That wasn't about BuzzFeed. No, but it was about, but it was about, nat it was about native advertising, and it was about yeah. something that BuzzFeed That's does, it executes extremely well, and the, the dangers of it, and the dangers of blurring the lines between what is editorial content, independent editor, and what is sponsored content. I, let me just yeah. defend... I just, I, I use BuzzFeed. I mean, I just don't, I, I think that the advertising on BuzzFeed is very well demarcated. I, I, I can't, I just don't get that at all. I mean, it's different kind of advertising than runs in other websites, but it, 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 you can, it says, you know, featured part. I mean, I don't, I don't understand what the issue is here. I'm not sure I do either. I mean, but I think like there with spot with native ads, like there are all these real like yeah, no, there no, are no. places where the editorial team writes the That's advertising, different. and that makes me nervous. But yeah, I think I mean like I mean everybody you know there are special there are sponsored sections inside the inside the um, the Economist. The you know I saw and an ad in the Times. Financial time. Times. I saw an ad in the Times today that it had been created by the IHT creative team. I mean I think you know like I mean I think there's sort of a great tradition of this essentially like. I mean, to me, like the best example is actually like Vogue. You know, like they have these great ads that are basically great content. If you cut them all out, people would be less likely to buy the magazine. But it's not because people are confused; it's because they're good. Right, right. So it, it's, it really comes down to quality and execution. And and reader notice. It gets down to whether the reader. It's obvious to the reader that this is a biased form of of communication. Whether it's an advertisement, not a journalistic, you know, piece of work. I, I mean. I, I think you, you need to keep that line clear. That's or else, the transparency. Yeah. I mean, you've dealt with but that I, quite a bit, right? With yeah, the, I mean, but I, I agree with Martin that on BuzzFeed, it's very clear. On 99% of sites, it's very clear. Yeah. It says sponsored. I think it's just much ado about nothing. If it's not clear, readers are going to be pissed off. I mean, this is just basic common sense. It's been, this wall has been there for hundreds of years. It's nothing new. Um, I do think, though, once once we've established that there is clarity and transparency around what is advertising, um, now if that native content, that native sponsored content is good in the case of BuzzFeed or any other publication, readers don't actually care. They just want content that's going to entertain them or that's going to be interesting or that's going to be useful. Who creates it, whether it's BuzzFeed's marketing team, I mean, if it's, if it's going to make them laugh, they're going to share it. They don't really care right. if it's sponsored or not, as long as no one tries to fool them. So the transparency issue is, is really key. You know, there's, it seems that there's like a lot of, I mean, and it's great that there's a lot of optimism about where we are in, in, in this disruptive media economy, a news and information economy. I'm sure there are things that keep you all up at night about that, that, that those, the challenges that are, that are out there and that what, what the, the hurdles are, what the obstacles. I mean, Elizabeth, you work with a lot of startups and um, content companies. And what, what are some of the real issues, the, the, the hurdles that you're faced with? And well, I think with, with indie publishers and startups, you know, they're, they're more likely to be flexible because they've had to be. I mean, if, if you look at sort of, you know, using Gawker as an example, the evolution of that company, they were one of the first indie publishers in New York to build a giant creative services team. They sort of realized that the publishers had an opportunity to, in certain ways, disintermediate some of the creative agencies mm -hmm. that were selling to brands. And I think that would have been much harder to make an argument for inside a large company like Hearst or Condé Nast because they weren't seeing margins fall that quickly. And if you're an indie publisher and you're already struggling to get the big brands to pay attention to you, you become very creative very quickly or you die. You know? <laughs> so in a way, in as much as I work with startups, I, I have the easy end of it in terms of uh, you know, being around people who are innovating very quickly and trying to figure it out. You know, the, the bigger challenge is when you work with a larger company that frankly isn't seeing these drops as aggressively. And so they think that they can procrastinate on finding new models. That, that's a lot harder because I, as somebody who comes out of more startup land, and before that I, I worked in finance, I was a buy side equity analyst, and I did not like content at all. I told all my clients to run away from it, it's not scalable, it's low margin, it's horrible. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think it's easier working with the startups. The, the bigger challenge is when you're dealing with a traditional company, 
and particularly if they're very established and they're still living off of, frankly, the, the equity that lives in their brand, they might not sense the urgency about how quickly things are changing. And they wait to innovate, and sometimes they wait too late. Is so. that, I mean, that's, you know, Martin, you worked for quite some time within the New York Times company, and is, is there, I mean, that is real, I think a real dilemma for kind of legacy media companies in the space to, to kind of turn the, sh turn the ship around or know when and where to invest and where your R&D Yeah, goes. I just fundamentally disagree with that, totally. You don't think that's no. true at all? I don't think that's true at all. I think that, in fact, if, if you look at the history, um, some of the companies that have gone away, I mean, you can call them stupid or, or whatever, but you're t basically calling an entire class, entire industry stupid, which is unlikely to occur. I, I think what happened in some of these places, I mean, Knight Ritter is a great example. It's one of the best case studies. You know, in, into the in, into the interactive business in 1980. Video tech. Video I tech, remember. right? Was the first partner for America Online, the first customer of Netscape, the first company to break out its own digital division, full of engineers, um, moved to the moved from Miami to the Valley in order to to you know get get that, and you know obviously a public company, so had some of those pressures, which is obviously a, a problem. But really fine management. You know, Kathy Yates, um, you know, who who went on to run Women.com and and CBS Market Watch. I mean, not, you know, um, so. The, but the problem is when your core business goes from you know spilling out tons and tons and tons of cash to very little money, it, it's you know o literally almost overnight. It's hard to you know, change your model so dramatically and also keep the quality going on the journalistic side. So, you know, I mean, and that, you know, Tribune Company, you know, very, very well-run company, same set of issues, built the largest jobs database in the world, Career Builder, actually outbuilt Monster, right. which is one of the myths. That, oh, Monster came along and took, no, no, Tribune and Knight Ritter partnered, built Monster, built Cars.com, cars Classified Ventures. It, it just was, it was Jeff Zucker's analog dollars to digital dimes. And you know, when you have these institutions undergoing that kind of seismic secular change, it's just very hard for the best manager to overcome that. I mean, with all of the activity going on, I mean, you take a business like, like Henry Blodgett's Business Insider. He did the event at the Pilot right, right. Center with us, okay? Really successful website. You know, he's got like 30 million uniques. You know, pretty successful website, right? You know, he told, he said in front of it, you know, he's got $20 million of revenue. $20 million. Now, I'm not saying that that's small. It's not small. But, you know, it's, it's also not at the level of, you know, keeping the lights on at a major journalistic institution. So just, it's just a question of, um, you know, of the economics of these businesses. And, it, it, and, and it's, it's not to say that, you know, the, the businesses like Business Insider aren't great businesses, perfectly legitimate, could be much bigger someday, will be much bigger someday. But to say that a company like Knight Ritter could have over the course of three or four years, which is when their business, you know, when replace those economics, when they started to try to replace them in 1980, you know, it, it just, it's, just not, it's just not a compelling argument for me.